on the phone, staff writer for the Marshall Project and author of the soon-to-be-released uh, Teacher Wars, A History of America's Most Embattled Profession, Dana Goldstein. Dana, thank you for uh, joining us today. My pleasure, Sam. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's uh, let's start in. I mean, the uh, let, let me start with a very broad uh, question that may seem a little bit counterintuitive. But are are teachers, in your opinion, and, and having obviously spent all this uh, work uh, researching this and and working in education, when we when we talk about the education failings that we have in this country to the extent that they are are, are failing are, are are teachers the the biggest problem are they the the solution hmm. well i think teachers are definitely part of the solution i don't think they're the biggest problem i mean i it's hard to say that there is one biggest problem but certainly we have an education system that is highly segregated by race and class in which our neediest children are clustered together and don't have accesses, access to the best resources, typically don't have access to the best teachers. So we've created a system that is filled with inequalities, and then we've said to teachers, you guys have to close these inequality gaps. And um, that's a very high expectation that teachers aren't always well equipped to fulfill. I mean, I guess that's ultimately uh, the point, I mean, on some level, as to why it's, uh, you consider it the most embattled profession um, is because teachers are the easiest, I guess, uh, target when we're dealing with uh, deficiencies, you know, these, these broader social uh, problems that, um, that, that, that show up in the context of education. Yeah, so we have this whole national conversation about inequality, and one of the ways we look at this is through the achievement gap between middle-class kids and poor children. And we, we look at the gap in test scores in particular, and we say, look, the schools are a way to solve this problem. And that is why teaching is embattled, and it is why I call teaching the most controversial profession in America in the book. Because when we have a very weak social safety net outside of the schools, and then we expect the schools to close inequality gaps, what we end up is a situation where expectations and need or ability don't always match up. Yeah, every every education, uh, every educator I have spoken to on this program, every education expert, and, and maybe that's a, well, I shouldn't say everyone, and maybe that's a self-selected uh, group on some levels, uh, but has said that poverty is uh, the biggest problem that we have in the context of education. Yeah, so we know that poverty and socioeconomic, socioeconomic class is the number one impact on children's ability to do well in school. However, we also know that teachers can make a difference. There's a growing body of research that shows that a great teacher helps a child earn more in terms of income as an adult, um, can help a child avoid becoming a teen parent, and can help a child become more likely to enroll in college. So we do know from these big longitudinal studies the great teachers make a difference. They're making a pretty small difference. So they're raising the lifetime earnings by the equivalent of about 500 bucks per year. If we want teachers to be able to make bigger impacts, then we need to kind of, my argument in the book is that we need to look at a broader set of policy solutions than what we've been doing, which is to attack teacher tenure and to have a big focus on standardized tests. All right. Before we get to those uh, policy solutions and to those issues of, of standardized tests and, and, and tenure, uh, let's go back um, to the, the, the founding of, of common schools. I mean, what, what we're, uh, we're now talking uh, almost uh, 200 years ago, I guess. Um, and and what, what, what were teachers, who were teachers in the beginning of, of uh, U.S. public education? So it's really interesting. What a lot of people don't realize is if you go back to 1800, 90% of American teachers were male. And that's really surprising because today 76% of American teachers are women. So how did this happen? How did this change occur? And the answer is that in 1800, there was no compulsory schooling. You didn't have to enroll your kids in school. So as politicians began to ask themselves the question, what can we do to make schooling universal? How can we get all kids in school? They were very cognizant of the fact that they would not be able to pay teachers that much money without raising taxes. 
raising taxes was just about as unpopular back then as it is now. So the way that they dealt with this is they just de redefined the teaching profession as a female one, and they recruited basically young girls to be teachers. And at the time, they would sometimes have only a sixth or a seventh grade education, and they were going straight into the classroom, really earning um, sort of working class, almost factory level wages. And um, uh, talk to us a little bit about Catherine Beecher. And um, uh, once um, once we've established now that um, uh, uh, women are the uh, are going to be teaching because we can pay them less, essentially, yeah. right? Um, yeah, so. uh, I mean, what, what I think at one point you describe um, uh, the, the uh, women almost being sent in as missionaries. I mean, as part of the justification to sort of. Uh, to pay them less. I mean, what what happens around uh, Catherine Beecher? Yeah, so she's a fascinating figure. She is the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who, of course, was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and they are, come from a strong abolitionist family. And Catherine Beecher, um, she never gets married. She's actually engaged to be married, and her fiancé dies in a tragic shipwreck and drowns. And she's trying to figure out what can women do to contribute socially. And she really decides that public school teaching is the way that a woman can have a meaningful life. But she's pragmatic, and she realizes that she needs to pitch this idea to policymakers. So she comes up with this idea that women are more morally pure and that they can bring Christian ideals to children and that they're sort of biologically predisposed to be better with kids. And um, she makes this argument, and the politicians listen to this, and they say, hey, this is great, and women are also so cheap. You know, we can we can pay them so much less than we can pay a qualified man, and so this um, this combination of kind of Christian missionary ideology and pragmatic tax cutting comes together to create American teaching as a female job. It's stunning how that has held. I mean, yes. I, I mean, what 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 account has there ever been a a time over the past whatever 190 years or so since that. Uh, that change happened, that, ha that, that, that just broad yeah. premise has been questioned? Yeah, so actually after the Depression, we saw a lot more male teachers than at any other time, and of course that was because the job market was so terrible in other fields that it, was, it became a more attractive job to men. One of the things that has been interesting as sociologists have looked at our recent recession is that teaching has not become more male during this recent jobs crisis. And people are asking why, you know, why is that? We've seen men going more into other professions that are thought of as traditionally female, but it's not happening in, with teaching. And I think there's a lot that has to do with the cultural baggage of the job. And we also have to look at the median pay. It's about $52,000 per year. I write in the book that a dental hygienist has median pay of $77,000 per year. So we're still seeing low pay, and um, that is, you know, something that men, there is some evidence men look more closely at pay than women do. And what, I mean, I, I mean, broadly speaking, what, what accounts, what accounts for this, for, for, for you know, we, we, we say that teachers are so important to our future, we say that um, they, we're asking them, obviously, to um, to make up for broader deficiencies in public policy. Uh, but, I mean, constantly the refrain is about the kids and about the, the future is education. How is it that, th that we have, I mean, what, what would you say is the biggest, I guess, uh, suppressor of teachers' wages, teacher wages? Mm. Well, it's hard to imagine paying teachers a lot more without either raising taxes or radically rethinking how we spend them. And I just, we're not in a political moment where there's will to do that. I mean, we see total gridlock in Washington, and at the state level, it's, you know, it's all about efficiency and budget cuts, and it's very difficult to see how we get over this. I mean, I think there's ways with our existing education budget where we can rearrange things, and I would particularly argue that getting teachers some more money early in their careers would be a good idea. Uh, one of the things I look at is that over the first five years of a teacher's career, say in New York City, you can only earn a $5,000 raise. In North Carolina, it takes 15 years to move your pay from $30,000 to $40,000, which is pretty wow. stunning. So you have to work 15 years just to get from 30 grand to 40 grand. And um, this is pretty problematic if we're talking about retaining the best teachers 
in most professions in your 20s and 30s, you can make some significant jumps. And uh, the way teaching is structured currently, if you're 28 and you've been good at this for a couple of years and you need to figure out whether or not you're going to, say, go to law school or go to medical school or stick with teaching, there's not a lot of sort of jumps in salary that you can expect at that phase of life where you might be thinking about starting a family or buying a home. And so uh, teachers are, are supposed to make up for sort of our austerity policies, but are also victims of it. I, 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 yeah, I, I, that is such a good point. I'm so glad you phrased it that way. And, and, and let me ask you this. I mean, and I don't know how, uh, how wide this experience um, uh, this is, but, but I'm curious in the, in the course of, of, of the work you've done on this book, if you, if you notice this trend. Um, in, uh, uh, in a town I used to live in upstate, uh, the, the the school system is uh, is not very good, and it's um, and part of it is is a function of just uh, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of poverty uh, in this town. And one thing I noticed about it was that there is a there's they're constantly building uh, new facilities. Like all the money in the education budget seems to go towards building new facilities as opposed to. Uh, uh, trying to attract or, or pay teachers better or provide them with more training or uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It seems like on a local level, there is, we have like a sort of a bizarre incentive structure where if you're a local politician and you can uh, actually like put some money into the local economy by hiring local builders and whatnot, um, you, there's a tendency to do that as opposed to sort of saying we're going to spend this two million dollars on a training program that will train our existing teachers uh, and get them the best education to be better teachers. Yeah, that's a really good point, and we see things like that across the country. And I think it speaks to this larger political and cultural. Um, fascination or obsession or attraction that we have to surface level indicators of educational success as opposed to deeper ones. And what you say about teacher training is exactly right. One thing we know about American teachers is that they spend much less time collaborating with each other to share best practices than teachers in other countries. And it actually does cost money to do this because we have to be able to take the teachers out from the classroom for certain hours of the day in order to spend time with other adults instead of always with kids. That might require sometimes hiring more teachers. So, you know, it does cost money to do what we want to do. And unfortunately, we're in a conversation where, you know, we're not investing. And uh, so let's talk about uh, the, 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 the current uh, so-called reform movement and, and, and how we've seen uh, examples of, of these elements of the reform movement in the past. I mean, let's, let's start with, I guess, um, you know, things like, uh, merit pay. Um, give me your sense of the value of merit pay, or I should say also the, the, the calculation of merit pay and where we have seen this type of attempt in, in the past. Yeah, so we actually begin to see this idea of paying teachers according to how well their students score on standardized tests. Back around 1915, we start to see this. And the people who are embracing it at that time are sort of businessmen, uh, corporate philanthropist types who are sharing ideas from business practices that they would like to put into effect in the schools. Um, and sometimes these are sort of like factory efficiency models that they're looking at in the school. So in addition to judging the teacher based on student test scores, they might actually use a stopwatch back in the 1920s to time how long it takes the teacher to hand out worksheets. So these are called um, efficiency reforms at the time. And they're not, in some ways, they have a lot in common with the sort of value-added measurement that we use nowadays to also measure the impact of the teacher on the student test score. And, I mean, I get, just give people a sense of what that is. I mean, I mean how do you take a... Uh, how do you calculate the value added of a teacher when presumably the kids are different each year? Uh, I mean, we're, and they're at different stages of development when a, a specific teacher gets them. I mean, how, how do we purport to do that today? Yeah, so um, 
value added is a really interesting measure because it's actually gotten a lot more sophisticated. So in addition to just looking at the child's test score at the beginning, at the end of the year, and seeing whether it goes up or down, there's actually a lot of very sophisticated and fine-tuned controls built into that. So we would control for the child's uh, family poverty level, for whether one or both parents attended college, even how many times the kid moved during the year, um, all those sorts of measures. So in this way, value added is, you know, potentially a fairer and um, more accurate tool than past measures to use test scores to evaluate teachers. And um, uh, give us a sense of, of uh, you know, I guess testing as uh, just in general, this, this use of high-stakes testing as a way of, of determining essentially which schools will, uh, will get funding, uh, which teachers will continue to have their jobs. I mean, uh, have we seen this before historically? We're in a moment now where we focus more on testing than ever before in American history. And the, t the 1920s and 30s might give us a run for that title, but I really do believe that our fervor for standardized tests is stronger now than it ever has been. And in part, that's because the Obama administration incentivized states by offering them federal grant dollars to evaluate teachers based on student test scores. And what I saw when I traveled the country as an education journalist was that schools were creating new tests in order to collect the data on all their teachers. So they were creating even pencil and paper multiple choice tests in subjects like art and music. And I even saw first graders in one district in Colorado sitting for multiple choice tests, even though some of these kids can't even really read the tests. So you do see a certain absurdities flowing from these uh, federal policies and incentives. And you see school districts where kids are spending 25 or 30 days per year in testing scenarios. And so we need to ask the question, what are the accountability policies we're creating for teachers? What are they doing to children in the classroom? Because you know, the effects of this flow down to our kids and the public and parents need to be debating this. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me, uh, you know, and I, you tell the story of uh, Sabina Trombetta, who is uh, who is one of these art teachers, I guess, who you were referring to. Um, uh, you know, the, I mean, it seems to me it's incredibly destructive. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, uh, that. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, it not only impacts the children because it 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 has impacts on them just in terms of like you know. You don't want to give a kid, uh, you know, you don't want to give a kid the task of doing something that's impossible for them to do because it discourages them to learn. It also distorts what the teacher is teaching them over the course of the year. No, I mean, ha have you seen a context where this sort of provides where this sort of high stakes testing um, actually enhances the education in the classroom? Mm. Well, we know that giving a first grader a multiple choice test in art is not developmentally appropriate. And any sort of child um, development expert or art expert will tell you that this is absurd. Um, however, you can imagine a situation where the child is more producing artwork and, you know, an evaluator was coming in and looking to see the kind of assignments that the teacher gave the kids, and it was, I guess, more of a portfolio model where there was some accountability to the teacher to really create an engaging and rigorous set of assignments for the kids to complete and that somebody would then take a look at that and judge that. But um, in reality, we don't see that many districts coming up with these more sophisticated measures in, charge, in part because they're more complicated and complex, and secondly, they're also more expensive. And I mean, but I mean, have you seen, uh, you know, in the course of your reporting, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, it seems like a, a real problem, obviously, to give a child a, a test that they're not uh, developmentally ready for. Uh, but have you seen a context where, and, and of course, I'm not talking about testing uh, in and of itself, but where the 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 results of the tests end up influencing the future of the school and the future of of the teacher's career so uh, decisively. Have you seen one where you 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 walked out of the classroom and said, "Wow, I this is really helping the kids in some hmm. fashion." Hmm. Well, I've definitely been at schools where they do take a very close look at student data, 
and it's a positive thing. But what I would say is that the schools that I visited that do that correctly are using that assessment data not so much to judge the teachers, but to help the teachers teach the kids better. Right. And that's what tests are actually meant to do. They're meant to be diagnostic tools. So, for example, if all the kids are doing poorly on a certain unit, you can see that through the test, and then the teacher can, can rejigger and re-gear their lessons towards that. So that is the correct way to do this. And the schools that are successful, that's how they use data. And, and, and is I mean, broadly speaking, uh, with the testing regime now, is it being used in that fashion? Because my sense is, I mean, I think that you know what you've just described seems quite obvious. You want to assess where uh, you know students need certain help, and you know, presumably, teachers do that to a certain extent, um, or, or do that to a large extent. I mean, that's almost sort of the the definition of teaching. Right. A good teacher, you know, assesses that this child needs help with reading uh, comprehension and this child needs help with focus and this child, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Is there um, I mean, isn't that the 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 issue, though, that we're not employing tests in that manner uh, as much anymore? It's not so much about just simply assessing. It's about really just pure on grading and the implications of those grades are, are, I guess, huge. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And part of the reason is that we create a lot of high stakes around these kind of spring standardized tests for kids. But if we were going to use tests the way they're meant to be used as diagnostic tools, we'd have to test kids, first of all, kind of at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the semester or new unit to find out what they don't know. (laughs) And then we'd have to give them a kind of similar test at the end of the year to find out what we taught them. And this is kind of totally different than what we're actually doing because you kind of know what the test questions are going to be in advance. And it kind of, it, it really takes away this whole idea of testing as accountability for adults and puts it back on the idea. Like, testing is for figuring out what kids do and don't know, and we're not doing that. Well, give me your sense of of what it's done to the morale of teachers across the country um, to, uh, you know, this series of, of uh, reforms of high-stake testing. Well, we definitely see teacher morale right now at kind of an all-time low over the past 25 years. The MetLife Survey of the American Teacher comes out about annually, and they are finding lows in teacher satisfaction. I think there's two factors there. Uh, One is the standardized testing push and kind of the cultural conversation that we're having about teachers, which has been discouraging to many veteran veteran educators. A secondary thing is the recession. Um, Teachers are really affected when there's budget cuts at their schools, and we see a lot of teachers kind of lamenting the lack of extracurricular options for kids and stuff like that. Let's talk also about the the sort of, um, you delineate there were uh, three methods uh, of teacher training that we have seen, I guess, or three sort of, I don't know, models, I guess, maybe, that we've seen over the past, uh, over the history of of these schools. Um, But, I mean, right now we have, I guess, three major ones, but they deal with, you know, the, and and I'm thinking in terms of um, the uh, Teach for America model. Tell people what the Teach for America model is and um, what it purports to do and where we've seen historical precedents for this. Mm -hmm. So Teach for America was launched in 1989, and it's about 25 years old. And what they do is they recruit a group of people. Most of them are just out of undergraduate. They give them just five weeks of training over the summer, and then that next September they put them straight away into a classroom in a high-poverty school. Um, So that's one model that we've actually seen again and again in American history. Going back to the 19th century, you asked earlier about Catherine Beecher. She actually started an effort to recruit girls from the East Coast to go west and open frontier schoolhouses for pioneer children. And those girls were actually also just given training over the summer, so very similar to what we have today. Um, and then and in we, the should say, we should say that, that, that these graduates of, of college, I mean, the, the perception is we're getting the best and brightest, right? I mean, that's yeah. the theory there, right? Yeah, it's definitely a best and brightest theory. And as I write about in the book, the social science is a bit hazy on this. There's not a ton of evidence that better students make better teachers. 
which is a bit of a head scratcher. <laughs> I mean, we know that more intelligent and intellectually engaged people make better teachers, but often that doesn't have a lot to do with what classes you took in college or what your GPA was. So there's something to think about. Um, we also saw in the 1960s an attempt to get the best and brightest into teaching through a great society program called the National Teacher Corps. And that took a lot of people actually in many cases out of the Peace Corps and put them into classrooms. And it was also, you know, geared toward elite college students. They had not been trained as teachers, most of them. And uh, this was around from about 1966 to 1980. And it was a much smaller program, and it was much sort of leftier and feistier. It required the teachers to live inside of the high-poverty communities in which they worked and get more involved with volunteer work in the community. And so... Did any incarnations of this theory of, of getting the best and brightest into the classrooms, has any of them worked? Have any of them worked? I mean, I guess it's really... Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at those sorts of programs in terms of scale. So Teach for America recruited 5,300 people this year, and schools overall hired 100,000 teachers. So we're talking about a very small percentage of new teachers do come from Teach for America. In terms of research on whether Teach for America teachers are effective, they look to be about the same as other teachers. They may be a little bit better in math, and that's because math is one area where having a stronger educational background yourself does seem to help, especially high school level math. It's kind of an exception to that rule I mentioned earlier. I think Teach for America's biggest impact has been a political impact. They have about 32,000 alumni who are working in the fields of public education. A lot of them are in the policy world, and they have a very specific, specific vision of what good teaching and what good schools are. They're very interested in data. They tend to be more supportive of standardized testing, and they're very supportive of charter schools, particularly a lot of non-unionized charter schools. So they have had a big impact at the policy level. Interesting. And uh, from a retention rate, they don't do so well, though, do they? Yeah, I think about 85% of Teach for America teachers have left by, I think, about four years after they're placed. And this is a much higher turnover rate than, um, than the general teaching pool, although the general teaching pool also has about a 50% turnover rate. So we don't really see a lot of retention in general among early career teachers, in part because it's just such a hard job. And, and is it your sense that, I mean, uh, my understanding is that uh, teachers don't really get, I mean, I, I guess it was I was talking to Jack Schneider, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but he's... Yes, uh, I know, yeah. Um, and uh, he explained that, you know, there's, there's a, a decent amount of growth in the first uh, couple of years in terms of, uh, of what a new teacher learns because they're in a, a new scenario. And this is when a lot of this sort of the, their, their, their real practical um, uh, education begins. And then things stagnate on some level, uh, but that you're not really... You don't really have the confidence that you need until you're about three or four or five years in anyways. Um, and uh, that we have a deficiency in training uh, teachers beyond that. But, I mean, so, uh, you know, uh, give me a sense of, of, of the other, um, the other past. I mean, who ends up being a good teacher? Do we have a sense of that? Yeah, so we do know 76% of teachers are women. We do know that only about 10% of teachers come from highly selective colleges. So most teachers are going to the sort of college that accepts most of their students. So we're talking about average GPAs and average SAT scores, those sorts of measures, which makes sense. You know, there's 3.4 million American teachers, 4% of all civilian workers are teachers. It's such a large profession that it makes sense that the qualifications of the people who do it are somewhat average because there's so many people, right? Um, I think that one thing we can do in terms of teacher training is teachers don't have a lot of time in their workday to learn from other teachers. So getting them into their colleagues' classrooms to observe and learn and see what best practices are, that's a way that we can kind of get over that flat line or, or um, hill that Jack was describing to you where teachers make a lot of improvements just by learning while doing, and then they flatline. And uh, talk to us about, um, o over the summer, uh, we had this uh, Viagara case where um, the, uh, a, a, which was in California and it basically uh, struck down as unconstitutional the, um, uh, 
uh, California's teacher tenure rules. And we should just remind people that when we say tenure in this context, uh, we're basically talking about a, um, a, a, do, a, a the vesting of a, of a, of a, a rigorous due, due process uh, process, I guess, for removing teachers as opposed to n you can never be fired. Um, the uh, Give us your sense of these tenure rules and um, just in, as to whether or not they are as probably, without addressing sort of the, 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 the case itself, because I, mean, I, I don't know what your opinion is of it. Everyone I spoke to felt that it was at the very least adjudicated on fairly ridiculous grounds. But we're starting to see that, obviously, in New York and other states across the country. Um, wh but give me your sense of the of the, just the merits of, of so-called teacher tenure. Yeah, so I write in the book that I support due process for teachers. And the reason why is because we know through history teachers have been attacked for all sorts of ridiculous reasons that have nothing to do with their competence. For example, we've seen teachers who disagree with the administration's reform agenda getting fired or removed from their jobs. In the past, we saw that with teachers who had unpopular political beliefs, and I, I think it would be foolish to say that something like that could not happen again. So I do support due process for teachers. I also say that it needs to be more efficient and happen at a, a faster and be less expensive. Um, in a lot of cases, principals are hesitant to have these due process hearings to remove a bad teacher because it's so timely. Um, so I do support kind of making these processes more streamlined. I think that what we see with these lawsuits across the country trying to declare tenure illegal is that they're based on a faulty premise. Uh, the premise of those lawsuits is that the reason why low-income schools are struggling is because they're packed with bad teachers. Well, we know that, in fact, uh, value-added research shows that there are teachers in those schools that are among the best in their regions, and also that the teachers who flee those schools, who are voluntarily quitting, are worse than the ones who stay. Mm. And that if you ask a principal in a low-income school, you know, what's your biggest challenge? And I've done this. Very few of them will say to you, tenure is my biggest problem. They're much more likely to say turnover is my biggest problem. You know, I have a revolving door, and I just want to keep my best people here and, and attract more good people. Um, so we need to be making those schools better places for teachers to work. There's a lot of ideas for how to do that. I think, you know, obsessing less about standardized tests, making sure there's a rig rigorous, rich, and collaborative curriculum in those high-poverty schools is something that we can do to get the best teachers to be willing to work in them. What, what is it that creates that revolving door, though? It's the fact that they're very difficult places to work. Uh, they're more likely to have a lot of administrative turnover. So, for example, if your boss changes, like, once a year, every single year, I think we all know from our own professional experiences uh, how tough it can be to work under a system like that, mm -hmm. where expectations are constantly shifting and changing. We also see that this mandate to raise test scores comes down uh, most strongly in the high-poverty schools. And often the test prep becomes the sort of de facto curriculum in those environments. And a lot of, you know, smart, ambitious teachers, they don't want to work like that. So they will avoid a school like that. So there's a lot going on. And just make that last point uh, uh, clear. You know, you have kids who, uh, because they come from low-income families, are far less prepared to learn, essentially, uh, in many respects. I mean, I think the, the data shows that, you know, you have a listening vocabulary of something like 20,000 less words when you enter into kindergarten if you're from low income as opposed to uh, middle or upper income. And uh, in, in the, 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 the testing regime exasperate, exacerbates the difficulties with a high-stakes testing regime. Is that, is that is that correct? Yeah. So what the, what the testing is doing is it's narrowing the curriculum. So one of the things we know about poor children is that by getting them out into the world to experience more things, we can build their vocabulary. So taking them to museums, taking them to the park, introducing them to all of the rich, wonderful words that are associated with experiences like that that we all know from being with the children that we love. They'll say, what's that? And it's a whole new learning experience, right? Um, so, but schools have less time. They have less time to introduce children to the wider world in that rich way because of the high-stakes testing. Instead, they're in the classroom, and they're drilling on these multiple-choice exams, and um, that has become, unfortunately, the de facto curriculum in many high-poverty urban schools.
So, I mean, we've, we've talked about some of the things that you perceive uh, could be solutions to um, these problems in education, which, uh, you know, largely it seems to me we have uh, problems less in, in our education system broadly, but more about um, there are just very specific losers in, our, in the education realm, and those tend to be um, uh, people who are in an area code or a zip code, I should say, that um, is poor. Um, give me a, a, a w one or two more of those policy prescriptions. I know one of the things that you you think we've got to do is is, is get more men into the teaching profession. Uh, wh yeah. What what would that do? Well, I think it's really important to get both more men and more people of color to be teachers, and that's because we know from research that when children identify with and and feel a bit of themselves is within their teacher. It inspires them to learn, and it gives them a picture of what a successful adult is like. So that is really important, and I think a lot of smart people in the education profession are now focused on this, on you know, getting more men and getting more diverse teachers into the classroom. And uh, what, what else would you see as a, a, a major um, a reform that would be helpful? I think one really big thing, which is so important, is to make schools more socioeconomically and racially integrated. So to do what we can to reduce these clusters of high-poverty children that are sort of divorced from mainstream society in many ways, that they are not really being educated with kids of different races and different classes from themselves. A lot of people in the charter school movement are actually waking up to this imperative. And in the magnet school movement, there's housing policy things we can do to make sure that affordable housing is you know, sprinkled throughout a region and throughout a city and not clustered all together. So if we kind of take housing and education policy together, uh, we can create more integrated schools through choice and kind of avoid those sort of busing controversies that unfortunately stymied the desegregation movement back in the 70s. And, and I, I don't think this is likely, but, but give me your sense of, of the way that we fund schools. I mean, it seems to me that um, funding a public schools via property taxes is one of the most problematic <laughs> things we have. You're right, because it creates huge inequities. And we only see a couple states that centralize all those tax dollars and then redistribute them so that there's equality, although it is a great idea. I mean, you see big disparities in a place like New York between suburban salaries for teachers and urban ones. So it's something that we need to address. What, what are those states that, that centralize the funding? Uh, you know, I'm hesitant to say right now, but I think it's Vermont and Kansas, but you're going to have to check me on that because okay. it's been a couple of years since I reported on it. But um, one thing to realize is that only 13% of federal or only 13% of education funding nationally comes from the federal government. And that really surprises a lot of people um, because we have these federal reform mandates and incentives, but actually it's very little of the money that they're controlling. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, Dana Goldstein, thank you so much for your time today. The, the book is The Teacher Wars, A History of America's Most Embattled Profession. Uh, thanks so much for, for talking about it. Thank you so much, Sam.